De Costa, and thank you, uh, Professor De Costa, for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Father Marius. I appreciate your welcome. And thank you for those of you who are here uh, live online. Uh, thanks for making the time. So um, in a moment, I will kind of go through the, some of the technical terms, but I just want to share with you something, which is when we talk about the words mission and dialogue, they can sound quite kind of technical, but fundamentally, I think the Christian life in its day-to-day -day existence is living out both dialogue and mission. So if I just take an example of a very close friend I have in my faculty at Bristol University, who's a Buddhist. So when I see him and when we go out for dinner or do things, it, in an interesting way, because we're both interested and deeply committed to our religions, I feel quite happy about trying to persuade him about the coherence, attractiveness, and beauty of mine. And at the same time, he thinks Christianity is false, and he has become a Buddhist from a Christian background. So there's a kind of mutual, um, there's, a, there's a sort of mutual mission or witness to each other. And actually that only happens through a process of dialogue, i.e. us conversing, getting to know each other and trusting as we have this conversation. So um, in some respects, I think this is really important to keep in mind that when we talk about mission and Thomas Aquinas has this wonderful thing of what we want for a friend, we want their greatest good. And that's what we seek for a friend. And the greatest good for us in the Christian life is Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. It's rather like um, I've just been to the Raphael exhibition in London, which I think is absolutely wonderful. I know I'm in Rome and I've got a lot of Raphael here, but to have it all together. And so I found myself telling friends, you really ought to go to that. And I didn't feel ashamed or embarrassed. It felt quite a natural instinct to want to share what one feels is the greatest good. So to turn to the title of the talk today, Vatican II is tremendously significant in the church's life for two particular things. And that's what I wanna focus on. The first is that it's the first council that begins to give a positive appreciation and consideration to the reality of other religions. And remember in the 60s, other religions have become part of Western culture and Western culture has been implanted in many areas across the world. But by the 60s in Europe, the United States, lots of people are encountering, encountering people from other religions on their doorstep. Now it's just normality in the 60s. This was a very specific situation that the church was addressing. Now the positive appreciation of other religions is absolutely fantastic and Vatican II gives us some clues about how to think about that. But in the possible excitement and the way that the teachings of the council were transmitted, there became a sort of um, movement towards speaking about other religions only in terms of dialogue, but not in terms of mission. And I think this is to misunderstand the council very deeply. And I just want to give um, three definitions of mission, which I think most people listening to in, a uh, kind of just random association. A lot of people have these, I think, very false associations, but for historic reasons, maybe not improbable. 
So one thing that I find with secular Western friends when I use the word mission, they immediately associate this with imperialism. That in the West, there was a, a, a time of great self-confidence where European Christianity was taken all over the world and often very closely tied to the colonial project. And I think that's a really important association and one that is clear that the council and subsequent teachings have been very, very careful to speak about mission not being part of a power expansion, a part of an imperial conquest. And in fact, as you can see from uh, my skin, I'm actually uh, a product of the Western imperialism in so much as the Jesuits landed in Goa. And from my name, De Costa, you may have guessed I was a low caste fisherman, probably an outcast. And we were very quick to convert because it meant we could get out of the caste system. And so, Indians like myself became Catholics in the 16th century. And although it was part of the history of imperialism, it was also a history that brought education, access to so much in terms of human well being, but the most important gift a transformation of life in Christ. So I'm not in any way wanting to deny the complex history of mission, but just to point out, it's certainly both torch and sword. It has brought enormous good to so many people and it shouldn't be associated with imperialism. A second word that people often associate mission with is arrogance. And the depiction is, I'm right, you're wrong. And most of us recoil from that, clearly. And one of the remarkable um, things that was written by Pope Paul just before the publication of Nostra Aetate, that remarkable document in 1965, in Paul's encyclical Ecclesium Sum, where he's talking about one of the new modes of missionary activity is dialogue. We must come to know the person we want to share the gospel. And listen to the terms he uses. They're very, very interesting and they're really not about arrogance or chauvinism. He speaks first of all about having to be clear, to have a clarity about the communication of the gospel. And that clarity is part of, I think, what this series is about, trying to make the intelligibility and coherence and attractiveness of the Christian message clear. But the second most important quality he isolates is meekness, what we might call humility, a listening to the other, a uh, remembering that at the end of the day, we are human and frail, although we testify to the risen Lord and a church that teaches the truth of that event. But we ourselves require meekness. Third quality, trust. Now, that why I'm wanting to just say this is that when one normally talks about mission, Trust, prudence, meekness are the qualities that Pope Paul VI wants to really bring to the center of mission and dialogue. The third and last point I wanna make about an association of mission is it goes alongside with that I'm right or wrong is a denigration of the other. Uh, and really, what is most important about Vatican II is it begins to speak about the other in concrete terms, which emphasize what we have in common and what is positive. Now, this is not an attempt 
to kind of whitewash or make everything look rosy and good. But it is an attempt to say that when we want to engage with dialogue, we need to find something in common. And we have in common our humanity. But as religious people, we can move on from that. The fact Nostra Aetate begins, we suffer death, we suffer anxiety. We all suffer, whatever uh, religion we come from, a series of similar questions. What is the meaning of our life? What is the purpose of our life? And in that sense, the seeking after common questions and possible common responses is vital. But none of that, none of that, I repeat, negates what runs through the Council's teachings about God desired all women and men to come to him through Jesus Christ and through the church that he founded in Christ. So there's a wonderful tension of deep commitment to the truth of the Catholic Church, <coughs> excuse me, a wonderful commitment to the deep truth of the Catholic Church and that we have God revealing God's self in this event <coughs> in Christ, as well as being very open to recognize how God is moving in the world. <coughs> so let's have a look at some of the council documents to frame <coughs> what I have been speaking about. And typically <coughs> when one's online, you suddenly get a frog in your throat and I shall struggle and my eyes will weep, but put up with me and I'll, I'll try and keep um, <coughs> the narrative going. So the first important document, and this is homework that's required of you after this lecture. So if you're in the least thinking, wow, that's interesting, I'm gonna set you very tiny amount of reading to follow through. And the first set of passages I want you to look at is from the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, paragraphs 14 to 16. And if you were to print them out on a piece of paper, it would be one and a half pages. So I'm not giving you too much homework, but I promise you it will be fabulously worth your time. Now, Lumen Gentium, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, actually frames Nostra Aetate. And sadly, too often people rush off to Nostra Aetate without reading the backstory of Lumen Gentium. And it's vital that the dogmatic constitution, if you like, throws light on how we should read Nostra Aetate, not reading it just on its own. Three very important points come out when you read 14 to 16. The first is, that the church continues its ancient teaching, which it cannot put aside, that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, and this is how God has willed things. It could have happened differently. God is, of course, free to act in any way God chooses, but this is the way God has acted in Revelation. In fact, in paragraph 14 is repeated the ancient teaching, but in different words, of extra ecclesium nulla salus, no salvation outside the church. And paragraph 14 makes it totally clear that the only, if you like, clause with it, with which must be kept in mind with this teaching, extra ecclesium nulla salus, is the clause that those who are invincibly ignorant of the gospel, who do not know it, are not thereby condemned. So it starts the framework in a very tight and clear way. 
after having spoken about the mission of the church to be an evangelizing church based on the nature of who God is, leading up 14. And Agentes also picks up that same theme. The church has no other existence except being a missionary church because of who God is. Now you might think at this point, wow, okay. So maybe that's what the Catholic church has always taught. Where is the room left? positively for other religions. And this is the exciting thing. You read on and paragraph 15 turns to the question of ecumenism, which I cannot stop to address, except to say here, we also find interesting developments within Catholic thinking in terms of the appreciation of other Christians. But I just want to say one thing about that. Paragraph 15 makes it clear that even with the recognition of the validity of baptism and sacraments and many aspects of church life, it is the belief of the church that the fullness of the Christian faith comes through visible unity with the Pope as the head of the Catholic Church and representative of Christ. So when we come to paragraph 16, we've seen a wonderful pattern of recognition, of isolation of real elements of importance. And even in 15 with other Christian communities, the recognition that their fullness comes about through union with the visible sign of unity. When we come to 16, then, we've come to a very important section. And it begins very clearly by speaking of those who have not yet heard nondum, the gospel. So when it now begins to positively speak about the other religions, it is not speaking about them as objective realities which have an autonomous and eternal validity, but we've already got a clue from that first sentence. It's speaking about them in the context of those who have not yet heard the gospel, what about them? How does God reach out to them? It has a fantastic footnote, and since this is uh, an Angelicum production, the footnote to the first line is the best bit of the document because it goes to Thomas Aquinas and that's not, not why it's the best but, bit, but because if you read the footnote and look at the text of Aquinas it draws from, it supports the reading I'm giving to you tonight. It will help justify the claims that I'm making. So the first line speaks about those who have not yet known, and then it speaks very positively, turn by turn, of particular religions. Now this is a very interesting moment in the history of the church. In the dogmatic constitution of the church, an outline of other religions in their positive attitude, their positive aspects. It does mean that Catholics can't just walk away from interfaith dialogue and say, oh yeah, that's for exotic specialists, or in my part of town, I never meet any other person except a Christian, which is quite possibly the case. In my part of town, I'm surrounded by secularists, atheists, Hindus, Buddhists, and in that respect, other religions are here to stay and cities and the world is now deeply interconnected. So we need to think about this. And the fact that you're listening to me talking about it means you've already thought about it. So great, we're on the same page. So Limon Gentium starts with the Jewish people. 
Remember the date of the document, 1964, after the Holocaust has happened? We have to recall that the whole question of the Jewish people only comes about through a concern from Pope John XXIII, who was involved with the escape of Jews when he was ambassador, to attend to the tradition of deicide. Now that's a really interesting and long story. I'm gonna to have to jump over it. But Yves Conga, who was uh, helping to draft this bit of the document, made a wonderful move. To speak about Judaism, he simply takes two quotes from St. Paul in the letter to the Romans. And no one can vote against St. Paul at the council because he is, if you like, part of the testimony of revelation. And the two passages that he quotes remind us first that our Lord comes from within this tradition, that the Jewish people have been a part of what it is to be Christian. They are the seed. The second passage reminds us of a theme that would be returning again and again and that is that the gifts and the promises made by God to the Jewish people are irrevocable. And that really did cause many people to think about what was being said about post-biblical Judaism. If God doesn't take his gifts and promises back, what does that mean about the significance of modern, what I'll call rabbinic Judaism rather than biblical Judaism. And that question is still being debated ferociously and with great passion because it matters. But what's important about that first section is it indicates that the Jewish people share with us divine revelation in the significance of the, what we call the Old Testament and Jews call the Tanakh. So this is a religion of revelation. And the dogmatic constitution on revelation is very clear that in a sense, when the church makes a step against Marcion and keeps the Old Testament as its primary canon, it is a unique situation of two religions sharing the same canon. Of course, their interpretation of it and the understanding of what constitutes it will change. So it's not exactly the same. Second point in the Human Gentium, third sentence is Islam. And again, what's very interesting, cited in that section on Islam, is a quotation from Pope Paul VI's visit to Jerusalem. And it says, together with Muslims, we worship. We worship the same God. It's a very curious phrase, but perhaps it's not so shocking because if we look at the history of controversy between Islam and Christianity, it has been about Muhammad as prophet, as the final prophet, and that was denied by Christianity for obvious reasons. And then the, the denial or the questioning from Islam about the Trinity being monotheism. But there's no actual incoherence in saying that a monotheistic God who creates and judges is the same God in terms of Thomas Aquinas's notion of uno deo, the one God. But what we have 
is already the distinction between two theistic religions and a kind of um, pecking order in terms of the closeness they have through one with Judaism revelation and two with Islam theism. So you notice something immediately, interfaith dialogue is based on really serious doctrinal insights. It's not just about being nice to people, and of course it should be that, but it requires doctrinal basis on how we are to understand and engage with the other. After those monumental statements, the document goes into soft focus, like a zoom camera slightly losing its edge. Because of course, at that point, it was rather difficult with theistic traditions, you can do business. When it comes to the non-theistic traditions of Hinduism and Buddhism, it's difficult to characterize. So the rest of Lumen Gentium 16 speaks about those who seek in images, drawing from St. Paul's image in terms of his uh, meeting, the mystery religions in Athens, where they seek something which they do not always know, but they seek something in that which leads to the truth. Now, this is a very interesting way, but the fathers were struggling to know how to characterize the Eastern traditions. But 16 goes all the way in terms of characterizing those who have no religion. And the contact point, which is true of all humanity is conscience. In conscience, when a person must choose, there is, if you like, the promptings of God. So final summary of that is that Lumen Gentium 16 speaks about objective elements in religions that actually are possibly ways in which God has been acting. And even for those who are in no religion or are atheist, clearly God is still acting within the conscience. Now remember, I said this was about one and a half pages. So it's a very, very minimal description and it's not trying to be a kind of directory of religions. It uh, misses out Sikhism, which some people see as um, theistic. It doesn't mention new age religions, which is very, very big soon after the council. And of course, that's why we have a church which keeps thinking about the new questions generated and addresses these lacuna, but so much for Lumen Gentium. Now, the last thing I wanna say is probably the most important in some ways, apropos the title I've given this talk, because the last sentence of Lumen Gentium 16 gets virtually no commentary in more recent commentaries on the council. And the last sentence of 16, after being very positive, very affirmative, also makes clear that the work of Satan disfigures the good and can obscure the good that is present. And that the church must continue its missionary task and paragraph 17, which you can read as a special go-to if you're excited by 14 to 16, takes us to the theme of mission. So the point I'm wanting to make then is dialogue, positive engagement is actually in the context of mission, not in the sense of saying, I've got it right, you've got it wrong, but actually wanting to share what is so precious to us and inviting the other to, not denigrating the other and being open to really what there might be there. Now, Nostra Aetate that followed a year later 
gives a little more flesh to the bones of Lumen Gentium. Osteritate is very important. And uh, looking at my watch, I'm not gonna be able to cover it as much as one would hope to, but for your second reading assignment for today, you have the sh one of the shortest documents in the council, uh, Nostra Tate, only five paragraphs. So I've asked you to read three from Lumen Gentium, five from Nostra Tate, and you can see I'm not a hard taskmaster. So Nostra Tate, begins with this sense of the common search that goes on by humans for meaning to engage with the mystery. It then, like Lumen Gentium, but reversing the order, breaks up the distinctions. So Lumen Gentium started with Judaism. Nostra Aetate begins with traditionally understood the Asia and, and African religions. Now you have to remember the backcloth to all of this was that originally there was going to be no document on other religions and no comment on other religions. But John's concern about the Jewish issue meant a statement was prepared connected with the Jews. When that became publicized, there was great concern about giving special treatment and positive attention to the Jews given the Middle East at that time. Israel 48 independence, uh, a huge war breaks out. At this point, Eastern Catholics are also involved in the Arab cultures that surround uh, Israel. So when Paul came back from his um, visit to the Holy Land, one of his uh, really brilliant ways of dealing with the difficulty of not shelving the Jewish concern was whenever the Jewish people are mentioned, Islam must be mentioned. And then when that came out on the council floor, it was clear that the Asian and African bishops were saying, hey, if you guys are talking about the religions that you experience. So there's this wonderful providential movement in how the whole attention to other religions happens. And I won't have time to go through each of the traditions that Nostra Aetate addresses, but I just want to, if you like, go to the last two, Islam and Judaism. So it does give much more. If you're interested in Hinduism and Buddhism, read Nostra Aetate, and it doesn't just talk about images and shadows. It starts talking about philosophies, the incredible devotional traditions of bhakti and Hinduism, the ascetic practices, the methods that have been developed in these traditions, all of which are, if you like, positively viewed by seeing them as great treasures. Now, please note, nowhere does it say these religions are salvific. Nowhere does it say these religions contain revelation in the technical term used in the documents, except in the case of Judaism. And that isn't because uh, these matters are entirely clear. It's simply that at the time of the writing of the documents, that was the clarity that existed. There has been debate subsequently whether revelation exists in Islam through its incorporation of textual and transmitted traditions from the Old and New Testament. So there are lots of fantastically interesting questions that open up, but I'm just talking about the opening up of those questions. So what does Nostratate say? It says, with Islam, it has high, if you like, ethical values that are to be valued. Concern for the family. That was actually struck out of the document because Islam permits divorce but there is much that is seen in terms of the value of the family, the value of festivals, the value of pilgrimage, 
fasting, prayer, and actually devoting one's life to following God's will. When it comes to Judaism, the document makes massive strides. It, first of all, takes away the charge on both two, two groups, all Jews at the time of Jesus and all Jews subsequently cannot be seen as guilty for killing Christ, the traditional deicide charge. And it's certainly the case that uh, John the 23rd's good friend, Yul Isaac, had said to him, this is the root of anti-Semitism and Christianity, not the doctrine of the incarnation, not doctrinal things that can't be changed, but this particular notion that the Jews deserve punishment because they have been collectively involved in killing Christ, stemming from a particular interpretation of let his blood be upon us and our children. The second thing about Judaism is it locates Jesus, Mary, and the apostles as Jews, which is a bit of a shock to some people. You know, the, the question we should ask, who's the founder of our church? A Jew. What religion was the founder of our church practicing? As good Roman Catholics, some people say, well, he was a Catholic. The answer is he was a Jew and a practicing Jew and a reforming Jew. He's also the son of God and the Messiah. And he also unsettles many Jewish expectations. But the point I want to make is the Jewishness of Jesus and the founding church is central. Third important point, and I'm gonna to have to stop there. Third important point is the condemnation of anti-Semitism and a later recognition that anti-Semitism by subsequent popes, that anti-Semitism should be impossible in Catholicism because we come from this Semitic root. Okay, I want to draw together what I've said because I'm much keener to hear what you may have to say than I've got to say. So I, I, I wanna make sure we've got time for questions. I want to draw together by saying this, the council is the beginning of a remarkable movement of creative, disciplined attention, reverent attention to the other, looking for the seeds of the word, as Nostra Aetate says, looking for the way in which God is moving through creation in different ways and in different degrees and in different manners. The council is also clear that this shouldn't be a kind of aesthetic hobby or a side um, uh, event for only specialists. It requires that all Christians be engaged in this, but also engaged with their own faith and therefore there is a connection between mission and dialogue. Paul VI is absolutely clear about that connection in 1964. Subsequent popes were more and more concerned that mission was falling off the radar. And we have Paul writing a second missionary encyclical in 75 and one of the most wonderful uh, missionary encyclicals, Redemptor Hominus, uh, Missio, sorry, Redemptor Missio by John Paul II in 1990. And mission to repeat, therefore, is sharing what is the greatest good that we have been given. It is not imperialism or I am better than you. In fact, Certainly in my case, it would be I'm worse than you as a human person, but the message, the goodness of the gift is special. And the church subsequently, and I finish on this, 
has looked at in more and more detail what constitutes another religion and what constitutes that which can lead a person to the good. And these are terribly important. And to recognize that God is moving in ways that we may not have predicted and do not know, uh, actually the normal human experience of another is you actually find surprise. One can be surprised by God in anyone. So this radical openness and radical commitment are the mark of Vatican II. And if you take away either one of those two dialectics, you lose the plot. Okay, I'll stop there and hand over to the question mistress. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gavin. Um, I know I found that your talk to be very insightful um, and very thought provoking. So I'm sure um, we'll have questions. Um, if anyone is watching on Zoom and would like to ask a question, um, just please type it into the chat and then um, I'll message you if yours is selected. Um, we also welcome questions from Zoom or from uh, Facebook or YouTube. Um, so if you're watching there, you can just comment on the video. Um, but to start off, actually, Father Mariusz has a question. Um, and then uh, please send other questions to the chat. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Molly. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, De Costa for the lecture. Uh, basically, I uh, agree with you 100%. Uh, so now I'm just trying to play uh, the devil's advocate here. Uh, concerning first the council and then a more practical uh, actions on the side of the church, okay? So first, concerning the council, uh, I think we both agree that the, the attitude of mission was present in the past uh, and we know it historically and we can give uh, proofs for that. So, uh, and still some of the interpreters of the Second Vatican Council, they claim that uh, the council was mistaken uh, and it actually brought uh, a betrayal of the mission uh, because uh, they, they seem to claim that instead uh, that the council did not uh, just uh, reinterpret the truth that salvation is only in the church, but it actually gave up on this truth that the salvation is uh, only in the church. Uh, so so this, is, this is the council itself. And then uh, there are actions of uh, the leaders of the Catholic church, especially John Paul II. So they would then go on and say, well, wonderful encyclical letter that he has written on, 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 uh, on missions, but then uh, hardly anybody reads those documents, what counts our actions because we, this is the culture of today. And they would say that him uh, asking, uh, I'm sorry, visiting, visiting mosque and kissing Koran was precisely a, a sign of an attitude that uh, overemphasizes dialogue and gives up on the mission because there is no corresponding action on the side of, of Muslims. So how would you uh, like, uh, you know, uh, answer or, 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 or react to uh, such a challenge? Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Um, that's that's great, and um, I appreciate both those questions, which are very helpful. So, the the, the first point about the reception of the council, uh, I think one thing I've discovered as a teacher is that often people know Vatican II from never having read the texts. I don't say that in any um, sort of dismissive way. But the council was transmitted through media. It's very interesting now, I often will find out something has been published through a media report. And then I go to the original document and I think, mm, wow, you know, the, the whole of that sentence doesn't appear in it, etc." So there is a question and it was in fact in certain textbooks that Vatican II made two claims. One is that salvation was possible in other religions and two, that mission, I mean, it's kind of logical, mission therefore was not necessary. And I think in a sense, this reception of the council is more connected with 
the emergence of a certain sort of the the issues I was talking about at the at the beginning that mission is seen as an arrogant imperialist connected with the Western colonialist plot, but also what's very important is the idea, and a lot of pre-Vatican II people think, you know, and say, well, salvation is only outside the church. So the logical conclusion is therefore there can be none outside if it's only inside. But of course, even before the council, we have a famous Leonard Feeney case where it's made clear that when saying salvation is inside the church, it is actually reflecting on the pattern of revelation that has been given us for how God is operating. So as Cardinal Ratzinger, or when he was Cardinal Ratzinger writing on this, says, I think very perceptively, there is no question after the council that people can be saved who are not Catholics. The really interesting controversial question is how and what is the status of their religions in this process. So I think the, t the first point of uh, that there, it is possible that a non-Catholic may be saved cannot be questioned, but how and the status of their religion, there is no clarity as yet. Um, so that's question number one. Question number two, um, I, th I think there's a sort of wonderful, important juggling act here. As people engage with the church, you are right, they don't read these fabulous documents that I'm setting for homework. They don't engage with these texts necessarily, and then what's important are gestures. And of course, gestures communicate far more widely. I remember when Pope Francis became Pope, I had a lot of non-Catholic students come to me and say, wow, what a great Pope. And I would thought, oh, what happened? And, you know, they don't normally say that about popes uh, in, in, in the UK. And it was precisely they saw a gesture by him, which to them indicated something. The problem is if you look at the gesture without texts or texts without gesture. I mean, John Paul II, when he went to Jerusalem, prayed besides the, the Temple Mount wall and inserted a prayer into the bricks. Any Jew watching that is going to be so moved at seeing the reverence, the care, the obvious love this man is practicing something very Jewish. So I think the, the point you're making is the church has a challenge. How does it communicate effectively in snappy enough sound bites as well as in its gestures? Well, one answer is doing these fantastic lectures on Zoom is the answer and trying to get across the message in an effective way, so well done. But I think it's continuing education and we're working against the tide. You know, um, when I picked up the newspapers on the stand when I was coming from London to Rome today, I just thought, wow, some of these papers, they communicate nothing except the fantasies of a very, you know, soulless culture. Uh, so it's important. And I, I think that balance is something is up to, again, every Christian, not just bishops and uh, teachers, but for Christians to be informed. Inadequate mm -hmm. answers to both questions, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so our next question is um, from Mapi Rodriguez. So if you'd like to um, unmute and ask your question. Hi, hello, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, do, uh, Dr. Da Costa. Uh, I have been lately studying a little bit about Orthodox uh, beliefs or Orthodox doctrines. And I, my question is regarding, do you think it is easier in a practical and doctrinal point of view that is easier to connect, to communicate with Judaism 
and Islam rather to with other Christian religions. With other Christian religions? Yes. And when you used Orthodox, did you mean as the Eastern tradition? Uh, for instance, yes, for, uh, related yeah. to Eastern traditions or other Christian denominations. Yeah. Are not okay. Catholic. Okay, th thank you, uh, Mace Macy, is it? Yeah. Matthew. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, my eyesight. Um, I think uh, there's there's an answer that uh, the, the answer should be no. It it should be easier. The church in paragraph uh, fifteen shows that we have so much in common: a common baptism, a common life, the gifts that Christ has made are shared with other Christians. So it would kind of logically mean that uh, we should have a much deeper uh, brotherly and sisterly union with them much more. Of course, I use the brotherly and sisterly in a very intended fashion because often in families, the most poisonous relationships can come out with the people we're closest to. So it will often be the case, as it has been for many centuries, that the relationships between the Latin church and other Christian groups has been very, very dark and difficult. And in one sense, it's perhaps much easier to speak to a Hindu or a Buddhist when you don't have that really difficult history to confront. Um, but I, I would say that if dialogue is really about building up personal relationships of trust and confidence, then at the end, you know, I, I, for example, my, my Buddhist friend that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I went to see an opera with him, the dialogue of the Carmelites. And uh, when it finished, he said, isn't that brilliant? And I thought, wow, how, how, why? Because it's, you know, all about a person undertaking death on behalf of others and very kind of Catholic theology. And he said, oh, because in Buddhism, we have this tradition of being able to actually pass merit on to someone else. And I was going, oh, you know, and we talked away so that the martyrdom at the center of that opera was something he could understand. And I can tell you, my Western Anglican friend who I'd went to see the opera with some time previously had much less appreciation of it. So I think the kind of um, closeness is dependent on historical circumstances, personal relationships, and I would say just endeavor because friendship is a great thing, you know. Um, but with, with Jewish people, the dialogue is a very difficult one because of the poisonous, very anti-Jewish history. With Islam, the dialogue is very difficult because of Christian freedoms or lack of freedoms in some Islamic countries, and also the history of the Crusades and the animosity between two superpowers as Christendom and Islam was. Um, so it's very difficult, but I, I, I think I'm blessed and I'm fortunate to say I have very close friends in all these traditions, and sometimes I feel closer to a Buddhist friend than a Christian friend, although officially I shouldn't. I'll stop there. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think unfortunately we only have time for probably one more question. So um, I'm gonna kind of synthesize a theme that have been in a few questions that have been submitted. Um, but um, I think what a few people are asking is, what do you think the role of mission should be in the church today? Um, what do you see is going on right now? What is the role? Well, the first, <clears throat> and, and um, I think this is brought up wonderfully in uh, Redemptor Missio, is that the church needs to be re-evangelized itself. There are far too many Catholics <coughs> who, you know, simply go along on a Sunday, which is great, but need to find the joy of their faith. And in a way, if you can't get Catholics to see it, you've really lost the plot. 
because at least some of them are still coming, etc. So one part of the role of evangelizing is, is you know, the new evangelism, a renewal. And I think the second most important role is confidence. Uh, this is certainly true of the European culture, which I live in, which has very little confidence about saying, well, I really think this is the truth. You know, we're in such a culture of relativism, such a color, culture where tolerance is falsely equated with just accepting other people's views as long as they don't kill you, which is a great thing, but it's not really the meaning of what uh, mission is. Mission is just witnessing. So the real question is, wherever you're listening to this talk, ask yourself, how am I a missionary? How do I actually witness to people who are not Christians? And it doesn't necessarily mean uh, a kind of upfront saying, are you saved? Which I remember I was greeted with when I started university and I found most offensive because I thought I was. Um, so um, to actually work out as lay people, as religious, whatever vocation you've been called to, how are you to be a missionary? And I think there's one simple answer as well, abiding in all those different roles, is in our fidelity to Christ, so that Christ can shine through us and our works. We do one tiny thing to help, but we should also remember at the same time, and I say thank God for this, that Christ is not only reliant on us, in terms of how he acts. I'm looking at the clock and I know I talk too much when I answer, so I guess I could, sh I should stop. But the role is, yeah, renewing ourselves, renewing our community, moving out with confidence and remembering that we're here to serve others. That's really the vocation of the church, not just in the preaching, but in actions as, um, was brought up the first question, actions of service are uh, as vital as reading these fabulous documents. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we're actually exactly at time. So you talked for the perfect 